Well, first of all, I am deeply honored to be in this institution in particular and by an introduction from someone whom I have only met recently and have come to admire greatly. Uh, Mr. Gandhi reaches to the heart of problems and pulls out their essence. Uh, I'm much impressed by that brief conversation that we had this afternoon and your aspirations for this country. I think creating infrastructure that enables others uh, is a very high calling, and it's something that many of you in this room, I think, are already contributing to and have an opportunity to contribute to in the future. Uh, I actually was considering uh, retitling this talk, The Indians Are Coming, uh, and, and I think that we want that to happen. Everyone in this room, I think, should desire that outcome, that, that you want to deliver on what should be a destiny of this population to harness and embrace high technology and make it useful not only for yourselves but for the rest of the world. And we already know you know how to do that. I'll come back to this uh, in a little bit, but I thought we would go back in time momentarily uh, to see what the originator uh, of the system looked like. This is not even the internet. This was the predecessor network called the ARPANET. It was funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and it was a simple four-node system. I was a graduate student at UCLA, writing software for the Sigma-7 machine in the lower right, uh, to connect it to the first node of this uh, very experimental packet switch network. The Sigma-7 is in a museum now, and some people think I should be there too, but, <laughs> but uh, the point here is that we started with a very simple idea uh, and, and explored its ramifications. And to give you a sense for how uh, interestingly we explored this, uh, remember the Defense Department was funding this work. And very quickly, we realized that if we were going to use computers to help the military with command and control, they would have to work in mobile vehicles. Uh, they were going to have to work in aircraft and ships at sea. Uh, and also, we needed for these uh, services, the, these packet switch services, to handle uh, voice and video and radar and other kinds of uh, real-time data. So the pictures that you're seeing here uh, are at the left-hand side, uh, this very nondescript large van uh, had a bunch of um, $50,000 packet radios. Now, you all carry something in your pocket which didn't cost $50,000, and it's a lot higher speed than these radios were. These things were about a cubic foot. You need to bring them around in a, in a big van. And we had people experimenting with packetized speech, some of you have used Skype, some of you use Google Talk, maybe some of the other things. We were experimenting with this uh, in the 1970s, but we couldn't do very much of it because the capacity of the network was very limited. But our aspirations were uh, very high. Uh, in, I have to tell you that the first time we were doing packet suite of speech with this system, uh, we could not carry a standard you know, digital voice channel, which is 64 kilobits a second, we had to compress the signal down to 1,800 bits a second using uh, something called linear predictive code with 10 parameters. The, the result of compressing this speech down to 1,800 bits per second is that it lost a certain amount of quality. And it turned out anyone who spoke through the system sounded like a drunken Norwegian. And when the day came for me to demonstrate the systems to some, to some generals at the Pentagon, I remember thinking, how am I going to do this? And then I remembered that one of the parties who was involved in the experiment was from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So we had Ingvar speak through the ordinary telephone system, and then we had him speak through the packet voice system, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> but we didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound like that if they talked through the system. Uh, here's another example. This is a ground station uh, in uh, Etam, West Virginia part of a multi-satellite ground station system that shared a, a common uh, satellite channel. Uh, the mobile radio network, the satellite network, and the original ARPANET were all part of the original internet. They drove the design because we had separate networks with different data rates, different error rates, different speeds, and we needed to find a way to link them all together in a very, very transparent way. 
and that was the design of the TCP IP protocols. If we fast forward to today, this is what the internet looks like from the connectivity standpoint. It is a rich, highly interconnected, hundreds of thousands of networks all interconnected and operating together. This picture is also important for another reason. Every single one of those entities that operates one of those 100 to 400,000 networks is operating completely independently of the others. Some of them are for-profit businesses, some of them are government-owned, some are academic, some are private, and they each make their own decisions about which version of software to use, which hardware. They each decide on a bilateral basis who to connect to. This is a highly distributed system. And part of the reason it works is that it accommodates a very broad range of incentives that each of these operators uh, bring to the table uh, for expansion of their service and for uh, decisions about uh, upgrading software and hardware. So this is a giant collaboration on a global scale. It's not centrally controlled at all. And I think that has given the system its energy. Anyone who wants to become a part of the system is free to invest in building pieces of internet and finding someone to connect to. In terms of uh, numbers, uh, there are an estimated 900 and some odd million devices on the internet that are publicly visible. These are machines that you would go to uh, if you were looking for uh, a web page, for example. But this doesn't really tell the whole story because in uh, the enterprise world, a lot of machines are hidden behind firewalls. A lot of machines are only episodically connected, like laptops, desktops, and especially mobiles and, and tablets. So the real number of internet-enabled devices in the internet is probably on the order of two or three billion. We don't know for sure because there's no one place where you have to register uh, to be a user. The number of users on the network is uh, estimated to be about 2.4 billion uh, as of um, January of 2012. By this time, it's probably at least three billion. And there are a lot of people who uh, have only recently gotten access to the internet by use of mobiles with smartphones. They probably increase the total number of users uh, to some uh, number that might even be as much as three or three and a half billion. We don't know for sure. But it's fair to say that the uh, percentage of uh, mobiles that will be internet capable, that will be smartphones, will increase over time. Now, as far as where the users are, uh, these statistics have been really fascinating to watch because over the last decade, Asia has ridden, risen very, very rapidly to the top of the uh, absolute population uh, uh, tree here. So there are at, at least a billion people in Asia uh, that are online, and the population penetration is still only 27%. About a half a billion of these people are in mainland China, uh, and their penetration is probably around 30% or so. So when India and China and Indonesia and some of the other very populous countries in this area are all penetrated at the same rate as some other parts of the world, we will have many billions of people online, just in Asia alone. Europe has a half a billion people uh, online, at a 63% penetration, but I've given up making any projections about Europe because they keep changing, they're adding countries, so the definition of Europe keeps changing, so it's hard to make any predictions about what's going to happen there. Uh, the rest of the statistics are, are as you see them. I have some statistics which I have been advised um, are reasonably uh, accurate. The number of uh, estimated number of users of internet uh, here are 137 million, which is about 11 percent of the population. Uh, the number of data-capable phones is 300 million, but it's only 80 million have actually been uh, enabled for data, and the number of smartphones is about 27 million. So it's clear that there is plenty of room for serious expansion of access to and use of the internet. I've shown some other countries that are in the region, and you can see that there's pretty dramatic variation uh, in the penetration of Internet in those countries. But from my point of view, it only stimulates my aspiration to see uh, the Indian penetration rate go up substantially. And for this, there has to be some significant investment in communications infrastructure, whether it's fiber or uh, wireless uh, access at the edges of the net. 
So one of the questions I've been asking myself during my visit here has been this one at the bottom, what steps can be taken uh, to increase Indian access to the net? And what I have learned is that there are strong uh, initiatives and efforts that are in progress to answer that question, to provide fiber capability to every village, uh, to look for ways of enhancing uh, access to uh, wireless capability. I think that there, you were on the edge of a really big opportunity to try to remove barriers to people's access to the internet. We need to reduce costs to make it more affordable. We need to take away any uh, barriers to access and sharing of those high-speed resources so that new businesses can be built up uh, and the, all the citizens can get access to useful services. There are a lot of things that are happening to the net uh, last year and this year especially. And I put these things up partly to reinforce the understanding that although the design of the net is nearly 40 years old, it was done in 1973, and the operational internet is 30 years old because we launched it on January 1st, 1983, this is still a very evolving system. It is one which is capable of absorbing new ideas, new functionality, and new capacity and supporting new applications. So uh, one embarrassing fact is that when Bob Kahn and I did the original design in 1973, uh, by a systematic analysis, we concluded that we only needed a 32-bit address space, which would allow for 4.3 billion terminations on the network. Now, in 1973, that sounded like it was a pretty good-sized number, at least to do an experiment. And I thought at the time that if this system worked, that we would then have an opportunity to design the production internet. Well, the experiment got loose, and so you're using the 1978 internet design. We ran out of the IP version 4 address space in April of 2011, actually February of 2011. This doesn't mean that the internet stops. It just means that it gets harder to grow if you need an address in order to run an internet service. I mean, think of somebody trying to sell you a mobile telephone and then they say, oh, by the way, it can't make any phone calls because I don't have any telephone numbers available. But this is a really neat little device, isn't it? So internet has, uh, has had, since 1996, a new format for its packets with 128 bits of address space. That's 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, which is uh, a number I'm sure only the parliament can appreciate. Uh, but that system is now uh, propagating into the network. We turned it on officially on June 6th of last year. We've also recognized that there are a lot of languages that are not expressible in Latin characters. A lot of them are right here in India, and so work has uh, been completed to allow non-Latin characters to be in the domain name space. So now we can use a variety of uh, scripts that would be suitable for Indian languages, for example. Uh, another thing which has happened in just in the recent uh, few months is the opening up of the top-level domain space. Originally, there were a few hundred, maybe about 300, top-level domains, most of them country codes, and a few of them were generic top-level domains like .net and .com and .org. But the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers opened up applications for new top-level domains. 2,000 of them showed up. So now they're sorting through. Sometimes there were collisions, people who uh, asked for more than, uh, more than one party uh, bidding on the same name. So that all has to get sorted out. Uh, there, now we're getting into geeky space here, and I'll try not to go too deep. But I do want to say that all of us know that there are uh, security issues associated with the network that there are viruses and worms and Trojan horses, there are things that uh, interfere with the domain name system and cause people to end up in the wrong places on the net. There are a variety of steps that are being taken now to make the network more secure. Those uh, technologies are propagating through the system. Some of them go in the hosts, some of them go in the clients, some of them go in your laptops, desktops, and mobiles, improved operating systems, uh, improved uh, browser technology to be more resistant to various kinds of attack. This process needs to continue, and it would not surprise me, in fact, it would be, I would be disappointed if our Indian colleagues didn't come up with some pretty smart ways of improving the security and safety of the network. I'm going to touch on some of these other points uh, later in the slides, so I'll skip past that. 
But I do want to bring up uh, this notion called the Internet of Things. These are devices that have become Internet enabled. And I will confess to you over the last 40 years that it, it never uh, occurred to me that a picture frame would be part of the Internet. Uh, but in fact, these are little devices that have programs and uh, have computers in them that can reach through the network and download images, store them, and then cycle through them. This is actually pretty wonderful. If you're a grandparent and you want to know what are the grandchildren doing, uh, your sons and daughters would take pictures of the grandchildren, upload them to a website, and your picture frame downloads those pictures. And when you get up in the morning, you just watch the pictures cycle through and you get an idea of what your grandchildren are up to. Uh, so uh, we do this in my family, except I don't have any grandchildren. That's a complaint I have to take to my two sons. They're, they haven't figured out something, and I don't. it's probably our fault. But uh, <clears throat> One thing I would like to uh, point out, though, is that the website that these pictures are being downloaded from, uh, if it is attacked and impenetrated, the consequence might be that the grandparents will see pictures of what they hope is not the grandchildren. So uh, security is really important uh, at home as well as it is at work. There are devices now that look like telephones, but they're actually voice over IP computers. Now, the, the, over on the left-hand side, this is an internet-enabled refrigerator. Uh, it has a nice touch-sensitive display on the front. And I don't know whether um, Indian families do what American families do, but for many, many years, the way we communicated with each other at home was to put pieces of paper with magnets on the front of the refrigerator. We have pictures that the kids had drawn and little notes saying, don't forget to go you know, pick up the, uh, the shoes at the repair shop. So now with these internet-enabled refrigerators, you have the ability not only to put things on the front of the refrigerator, but we can email each other, we can put up our websites, we can blog, and we can do all kinds of other things. But the more interesting possibility uh, is that uh, if we could put little RFID chips on the things that go into the refrigerator, the refrigerator would know what it has inside. And the consequence of that is that while you're off at work or at school, the refrigerator could be surfing the internet looking for recipes that it knows it could make with what you have inside. So when you come home, you would see a list of recipes that you could have for dinner. Now, you can extrapolate this. You can imagine uh, that you're on vacation and you get an email. It's from your refrigerator. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the milk was put in there uh, three weeks ago, and it's going to crawl out on its own now if you don't do something. Or maybe you're shopping and, and you're, you get an SMS, it's a refrigerator calling, don't forget the marinara sauce, I have everything else we need for spaghetti dinner tonight. And I'm sorry to tell you that uh, our Japanese friends have really spoiled this beautiful image. They've invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. <laughs> so when you step on the scale, it figures out which family member you are and it sends that information to the doctor and it becomes part of your medical record all of which is perfectly reasonable. There's only one problem. The refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> and when you come home, you see diet recipes on the display, or maybe it just refuses to open because it knows you're on a diet. So this doesn't sound like the kind of future that we want. Now, there's, there's a fellow in the middle here that uh, I've not met. He's Dutch. Uh, and he has invented an internet-enabled surfboard uh, and all I can imagine is that he was sitting on the water waiting for the next wave, thinking, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting to get... <laughs> so he installed a laptop in his surfboard, he put a Wi-Fi service in the rescue shack on the beach, and he now sells this as a product. And finally, I used to tell jokes about internet-enabled light bulbs, thinking, you know, someday every light bulb will have its own IP address. I can't tell jokes about this anymore because a few weeks ago I received in the mail an internet-enabled light bulb with LED lights and an IPv6 radio inside. This is a not an inexpensive product. It costs about $15. But it will last about 15 years because it's LEDs rather than incandescent or fluorescent. And this means that it can be controlled remotely. You can tell what state it's in. You can turn it off, turn it on. Uh, so I can't tell jokes anymore about internet-enabled light bulbs. I'm going to have to find some new material. So this internet of things is absolutely coming. 
uh, I'll, uh, early, uh, later I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the American Smart Grid Program, which uh, just reinforces this whole notion. Um, I mentioned uh, briefly that, or, or at least one of the slides mentioned, that sensor networks are becoming a, a part of the Internet environment. It's not at all un, uh, uncommon now to have a sensor network which is reporting its state and maybe even accepting control remotely through the Internet. So it could be ventilation and air conditioning, it could be security, uh, it could be other kinds of reporting going on about the status of a building, or an, um, and it could be a residence, or it could be an office building, or it could even be a manufacturing facility. So these kinds of sensor networks are going to become a part of the Internet environment as well. This happens to be a picture of a sensor network I have in my house. It's an, an IPv6 radio network. Now, this is not me with a soldering gun in the garage. This is actually a commercial product. I um, got it from a company called Archrock, which uh, was acquired by Cisco Systems a couple of years ago. This system has little um, mobile size sensors that run on two AA cells. They last nearly a year. And they're sitting in each room in the house. And every five minutes, they wake up and they measure the light levels, the uh, temperature, and the humidity in each room, and they report that to a server down in the basement. Now, I know, it sounds like something only a geek would do, but I had a, a, I'm an engineer, and I believe in real data, and at the end of the year, I have all this data about how well did the heating and ventilation and air conditioning work in each room in the house. So when it comes time to adjust the system, I don't have to rely on anecdotal information. I have real engineering data to do this. Now, one room in the house is a wine cellar, and it's very important to me to keep the temperature below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the uh, room warms up uh, beyond 60 degrees, I get an SMS on my mobile. This, this has happened a few times when the power has failed, and occasionally when this has happened, no one is at home to reset the cooling system, and so I keep getting these notes every five minutes from my system saying, your wine is warming up. So I, one, once I was away for two or three days, and I kept getting this you know, warning that my wine was uh, warming up. So I called the Artrock guys, and I said, do you make remote actuators? And they said yes. And they said, are they strongly authenticated? And I want to make sure that I'm the only one that can do this, not the 15-year-old next door, and I don't want messing around with my wine cellar. And they said yes. So that was a weekend project to install. And then I got to thinking, you know, I can actually tell if someone's gone into the wine cellar when I'm not there because I can see if the lights have gone off and on, but I don't know what they did in there. So this led me to decide that I should put RFID chips on every wine bottle. And then I can do an instantaneous inventory to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. And I was proudly explaining this design to one of my engineering friends who said, you have a bug in your design. What do you mean I have a bug in my design? He said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. <laughs> so he was right. Now we have to put sensors in the cork. And as long as we're going to do that, we might as well sample the esters that give the flavor to the wine and see what condition it's in. So now before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And if that's the wine that got up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit because of the cooling system failure, that's the bottle you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. So this is a very practical thing to have. Uh, in honesty, lots and lots of these sensor systems will become part of the Internet environment because they will help us observe, measure, and manage the way in which we use uh, re non-renewable and renewable resources. It will help us understand how our choices, our lifestyle choices, affect our use of these important resources. So I'm anticipating that we will see many, many hundreds of millions of these systems too. It's my belief that there are many business opportunities nascent in the network which will someday come to uh, India. We already know that you understand information technology. The companies that have outsourced IT services to places where the internet is already heavily uh, invested uh, is a very, very important indicator because it shows that your colleagues have figured out 
that they can service demand even if it isn't domestic. And that's been a very, very important lesson. So we already know you understand this. The question is, can we take advantage of that understanding and grow a domestic market too by injecting internet capability uh, around the country? Now the reason that, uh, that this works at all is that there are standards, there are platforms, servers, uh, cloud-based systems and the like that create interoperability. Standards are absolutely key here because what they do is uh, create interoperability which you would have had to get by a bunch of bilateral negotiations with a lot of different parties to make sure things would interwork. By everyone observing the same set of standards, now you know that just like when you connect your computer to something on the internet, you can get to all 900 million machines because you know that they all speak the same language. So we, sh we should be taking advantage of that and people have. The result of the standards is that third parties uh, like Infosys and Wipro and others have managed to offer services to people across the network because of those standards. Uh, we can, you can imagine a variety of things like mobile applications. How many people are you know, taking advantage of hundreds of thousands of apps on their mobiles? Well, lots and lots of people have created those applications because there were standards for designing the app that would, would work on all the mobiles. So this is, again, taking advantage of a standard to allow lots and lots of people to exercise their creativity. That's sort of the essence of what I hope can happen here. There remains to be done some pretty interesting standards making. For example, there are lots of different clouds. Google has a cloud, Microsoft has a cloud, Amazon has a cloud, IBM makes private clouds, but they don't interwork with each other. We're sort of in the same place in the cloud world that we were in 1973 when there were proprietary computer networks that didn't interconnect with each other. So this is a big opportunity we can now start exploring what does it mean to interconnect the clouds together, move data back and forth from one cloud to another. Before the internet was in place, you could be sitting on a network and there was no way to say, send this data to another network. You couldn't even say what the other network's name was. There wasn't any vocabulary for that. Same is true for clouds now. So there's a big opportunity. Something else which, uh, again, uh, something that, uh, that has been contributed to by some of your colleagues, and that's using the internet to deliver educational material to a large number of people simultaneously. My colleagues at Google, uh, Peter Norvig, Norvig and uh, Sebastian Thrun, are, are uh, adjunct professors at Stanford University. And last year, they decided they would like to teach a course in artificial intelligence on the net. And they thought maybe they would get 500 people to sign up. In fact, 160,000 people signed up all around the world. And the next course that was offered, there were 395,000 people signed up. Well, this is a sort of a, uh-oh, what do we do now problem. And the answer is that they rewrote a lot of the software in order to cope with scale. 23,000 people of the 160,000 actually passed the course. And although some people will say, ha, huh, see, it was really terrible, only a small fraction, one-eighth of the people passed the course, I did the other back of the envelope calculation. 23,000 people completing that course was more students than have ever taken that course in the history of Stanford University since Stanford started teaching computer courses in one swell foop. So there is a big opportunity here and once the infrastructure is in place, education is going to be much more reachable to people who otherwise would not have access to it. These courses are free right now there are some issues about what business model will allow them to be sustainable. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they are a very, very efficient way of delivering uh, substantial quality information to very large numbers of people. Another thing which uh, is a big issue these days, of course, is uh, internet uh, infrastructure and telecommunications. And here again, there are uh, paths towards creating infrastructure here in India uh, which are uh, being pursued, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really eager uh, to see all of this uh, happen. Now, I wanted to move to another topic, which is what we call in the U.S. the smart grid. This was an initiative that started four years ago, um, initiated by the Department of Commerce and the Department of Energy. 
Their idea was to take energy consuming devices, electricity consuming devices, and have them do two things. The first thing was to report their usage and accumulate that so that when you got your bill at the end of the month, you could actually figure out which appliances consumed that electricity. What did you do to cause that bill to be what it was? The second thing that they wanted to do is to make these devices, especially the ones that consume a lot of electricity, like air conditioning or heating, water heating or uh, washing machines and things like that, to, be, to receive advice, for example, please don't run the water heater for the next 10 minutes. We're reaching a peak load, and if we can clip the peak load, then we won't have to use expensive additional peak load power generation capacity. Instead, we'll clip the load. So this is called demand response. Up until now, there has been no capability to do that. All you could do was either meet the demand by generating power with peak load capacity or suffer rolling brownouts and blackouts. So this notion of being able to manage demand is a, a very, very interesting point, and it saves not only money, but it also saves efficiency. If you, use, if you build peak load generation power, uh, uh, generation capacity, and it only gets used 2 or 3% of the time, the cost per kilowatt hour of that generation capacity is very, very high. If you can clip the load, you never spend the money. So there are a lot of details here, but the idea is that the smart grid is intended to allow uh, a variety of devices to be able to report their status, to accept some kind of control. And once you have those standards in place, you can have third parties that are capable of managing some of these systems for you. I'm, oh, okay, so now there is a, a really interesting problem if you go down here to consumption and, and production. The original designs were very much focused on devices that consume electricity. But we're entering a period, uh, certainly in the U.S., and I don't know about here, where we are looking at a variety of new ways of generating power, whether it's wind power or solar power, geothermal power, and, and more uh, recently we have uh, electric automobiles with large storage capacity, and in a sense, if they're connected to the grid, under some conditions they can actually put power back in the grid as opposed to simply consuming it. So suddenly we have the possibility of, of both pushing power, generating and pushing power into the grid from the edges in addition to pulling power from central sites. And it is leading to the idea that maybe we shouldn't be building large scale power plants that are very expensive and rather build a larger number of smaller power plants, maybe even going down into neighborhoods. These kinds of technologies allow a much more distributed generation of power. This may produce a much more reliable environment where you don't have one power outage caused by the loss of one big giant uh, production plant. And also, if the power isn't being pushed as far uh, over the power lines, you don't have as much loss. So there may be some really interesting, more distributed ways of generating power once we have the ability to manage these kinds of systems. Uh, the Japanese are actually pursuing uh, another rather interesting idea. And for those of you who might be electrical engineers or who are interested in significant uh, you know, departures from uh, normal, the Japanese are looking at essentially a power internet where you can uh, assess demand for power and distribute the power in this, almost the same way that we distribute packets. It's really important is that if we do uh, increase access to the internet, it's going to be important that there's some util useful information for the citizens to get access to. There's also a real need to present that information in local languages so that it's assimilable. One thing which I think is very exciting is that the uh, plans here in India for propagating the fiber network to the villages have also come together with propagating information to those citizens from the government. So getting access to government information about what do I do to get a passport, what do I do to get my car registered, what do I do to register my business, uh, what local businesses are there in the area that I can turn to, all of that local kinds of information is what makes the internet useful uh, to people and that has to be an opportunity to generate new kinds of business as well. Uh, another thing which I've already implied is that you can export services to places where internet is already heavily penetrated while you are working on getting a domestic penetration to become a market to consume those services as well. Uh, it's pretty clear that 
uh, the ability to move money around can be a lubricant in e-commerce. And you can even imagine moving electronic money around can be a lubricant for conventional commerce too. If you're moving goods and services and you make it easy for people to pay electronically, you eliminate the need for the cash economy. Uh, you make actually a much more reliable way of, of making sure money doesn't disappear where it shouldn't. So these online transfers uh, can remove a lot of the problems that we experience in a cash economy. Uh, a thing that I find interesting is the idea of vendors and buyers and marketplaces. Internets are a really powerful way, together with the cloud-based systems, for doing exactly this, finding buyers and, uh, and vendors. I had the opportunity to visit uh, some people uh, in a village outside of uh, New Delhi, and uh, two of the people I talked to uh, were uh, an electrician and a uh, plasterer, and we asked them about you know, how they found business, and it was almost always word of mouth. They didn't have any way of making it known, other than this very direct way, that they had products and services that were available. If they could be found through the internet, then their businesses could, uh, could certainly grow, because part of the problem in a business is finding customers. So this is another possibility. And finally, uh, we asked, I met with two 12-year-olds who are using the internet in sixth grade. Some of them are you know, using it to compose uh, responses to homework assignments. One young fellow was actually a budding artist. He was using a digital program to do some really impressive artwork. So I asked them, what do you think the internet should be like five years from now? What would you want it to be like? And I would be afraid to answer that question. People ask me, and I don't have a clue. The instantaneous response was they wanted the internet to talk to them, and they wanted to talk back to it in their local languages. I mean, I'll, you know, this is a 12-year-old speaking. I think I need to get a T-shirt made that says, um, don't look now, there's a 12-year-old uh, you know, uh, catching up with you. So uh, this idea of having language understood by computers is actually on, on the cutting edge of uh, technology today. At Google, we have a project called Project Glass. This is a, something that looks like a pair of glasses, but it has a television receiver. It has a little projector that only you can see. You know, you have to look up over here, and you can see a screen just like you would see on a laptop or your mobile. It has a microphone, and it has a little ear set that, uh, that you can hear uh, from. And the idea here is to have the computer be part of your sensory environment. So it's hearing what you hear, it's seeing what you see, it's trying to learn from that, and it's trying to be helpful. It might be able to interpret gestures that you make, like what's that building over there? Where's the nearest petrol station? Uh, what's, what does this menu mean? I don't know how to read it. There are programs that will translate things. If you can see the image, and in, uh, correctly interpret the image and translate it, you can look, and in my case, if I was looking at something in, uh, you know, in Hindi, I would need help. And so my Google Glass would be a way of assisting with that. These are all feasible. They take some serious uh, development work, but we're moving ahead at Google on these things, and I'm sure that some of your colleagues could do the same. So if I had to summarize what the most critical elements are that have made the internet successful. One of them is the standards are very open. Anyone is free to contribute. The Internet Engineering Task Force is the place where most of the standards in the internet are developed. And it's a rather funny organization because you can't join it. There's no place to go to sign up. All you can do is show up. And if you show up and you have ideas that other people find uh, of interest, then something will happen. If they find your ideas are not of interest, then nothing will happen. But you don't have to sign up. You don't have to pay a membership fee. You just have to show up. Another thing is that the interoperability of various platforms makes the internet a very fertile place in which to invent new applications because they can propagate very, very rapidly. Neutrality here is really important. And by this I mean that, that there is equal access to any party who wishes to use these resources, who wishes to put up new products and services. Uh, it's a very interesting fact that you don't have to get permission to put up a new product or service on the internet. I can guarantee you when Larry Page and Sergey Brin were doing the uh, Google service, 
that they didn't have to go around to every internet service provider in the world to get permission. All they had to do was put the service up and use it. Finally, I want to point out that there is a, a very interesting difference between the telephone system and the internet system. In the telephone system, uh, it's kind of asymmetric. If you make a phone call, you pay for everything between you and the person who receives the call, including settlement and termination charges. In the internet, it's very different. You pay the local internet service provider to be on the net, and after that, you start exchanging packets and running whatever applications you want to. All the stuff that goes on in between, you don't have to worry about because that's worked out among the other uh, networks. So uh, in the interest of time, since I've been going on now for 45 minutes, I want to skip to my last little bit, and that's to tell you the status of a project called the Interplanetary Internet. When this first came up in 1998, people thought I was, uh, you know, had finally gone over the top. The honest answer, though, is that my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory we're thinking about the um, uh, Mars lander, it was called Pathfinder, it was a small little robot that had landed in 1997 and we were thinking, okay, it's 1998 now, the next year, what should we be doing with technology that will be needed in 25 years? And so we started thinking about the future plans for uh, sending uh, robotic systems to Mars and as we thought more and more about this, uh, we thought, well, we really need rich networking just like we have in the internet where you can plug into the net and talk to 900 million things and you don't have to worry about how they all got there. The network takes care of that. Instead of using point-to-point -point radio links, we wanted to have this rich networking capability for space exploration. We thought we could use the TCP IP protocols and that, last, that idea lasted for about five minutes and then we realized there were a couple of problems. One problem is that the speed of light is too slow, and we haven't figured out how to fix that. So uh, the problem is the distance between the planets is so big that between Earth and Mars is 20 minutes one way and 40 minutes round trip time when we're farthest apart in our orbits. And even when we're closest apart, uh, closest together, it's seven minutes of round trip time. The TCP IP pro protocols weren't designed to deal with that kind of delay. Then we have another problem that's called celestial motion. The planets are rotating and we haven't figured out how to stop that either. So when you're talking to something on the surface and the planet rotates after a while, you can't talk to it until it comes back around again. So this is variable delay and disruption. So we had to invent a set of protocols that would handle this variable delay and disruption, which we have now done. We've iterated it several times. They're on board the orbiters around Mars. They are on the landers on Mars, the old rovers, the Spirit and Opportunity, and the new um, uh, lander that arrived in um, uh, August of this year, Curiosity. And it was also on board Phoenix, which landed on Mars in the North Pole in uh, 2008. So our purpose now is to standardize the protocols so that any spacefaring nation could use them if they want to. And once they finish the mission on a particular uh, robot, for example, they could repurpose that spacecraft to become part of an interplanetary backbone. So we're imagining that as missions are launched one at a time, if these protocols are used, eventually those spacecraft will become part of a growing interplanetary backbone. And that for me is very exciting because it will make it possible to support both manned and robotic missions uh, to the outer planets. Now there is one more little bit to this the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which supported the original ARPANET and the Internet and the interplanetary architecture, is, has now uh, released a um, project, uh, funding for a research project on the design of a spacecraft to, meet, to reach the nearest star in 100 elapsed years. Now this poses three problems. Problem number one uh, is propulsion the current propulsion systems would take 65,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri, which is 4.4 light years away. That's a little long, even for an ARPA experiment, that's six times longer than our civilizations have been around. Uh, so that's problem number one. We'll probably end up using some kind of a really large scale ion pulsed engine. The second problem is navigation. The stars aren't where you think they are because it takes light time to get there and by the time the light gets there, the stars have moved. So I got really worried. I thought, well, this poor spacecraft is going to get part of the way to Alpha Centauri. It's a light year away. 
and I'm going to try to tell it what to do to do mid-course correction. It takes a year for the signal to get there and another year to find out did it work or not. And so, you know, this is not a real, you know, real-time proposition. Fortunately, we know a lot about the proper motion of the stars, and we've concluded that um, the navigation actually can be done autonomously on board the spacecraft, so that problem is pretty much solved. Then the final problem, the one I'm most interested in, is called communications. And the question is, how do you generate a signal from four light years away that you can actually detect? Yeah, you know, uh, so because this is a finite sized spacecraft, I mean, it's not like, you know, somebody else's star and you can't put a big blinder on the star and blink it like a, a semigraph uh, or telegraph or something. So anyway, we have to figure out how do we generate a signal that can be detected from four light years away. And we've been looking at the lasers, a very, you know, short burst femtosecond lasers. The problem is that even with a very, very high power short burst, you're still sending the light wave four light years away. And by the time it gets to the planet, or it gets here to the solar system, it's actually about the size of the solar system because of the beam spread. So now you know why I want the interplanetary backbone, so I can build a synthetic aperture receiver the size of the solar system so I can pick up the signal. But one of the physicists said, you know, there's another possibility. Everybody knows that uh, gravity bends light. So the sun has a big gravity field, and if you go 550 astronomical units away from the sun, that's the focal plane of the sun's gravity field. So you could use a gravity lens in order to focus the light coming from Alpha Centauri. So if we can figure out how to get a spacecraft out to that distance away from the sun, we've never been that far away, uh, we can actually use a gravity lens instead of having to use the big interplanetary backbone. So that's the up-to-the-date story on interstellar uh, you know, exploration. I appreciate very much the time to talk, and I'm happy to try to respond to questions, and I am very, very grateful to be here with you this evening. Thank you.